Hello and welcome you early birds to uh, this episode of Liquid Margins uh, hosted by Hypothesis where we're going to be talking about annotating uh, in STEM education. Um, we're going to let folks uh, file in here uh, slowly so i um, not going to get started just yet but I did want to welcome you and uh, if you're here for Liquid Margins then you are in the right place and we're looking forward to uh, you joining this conversation. So hang tight and we'll get started in just a couple minutes. And once again, for those uh, filing in, uh, this is Liquid Margins episode 42, hosted by Hypothesis. Uh, we're here to talk about annotating in STEM education. And we'll get started in just about 32 seconds or so. Um, just making sure there's not anybody, any stragglers coming in here in the first minute after the hour. Don't want anybody to miss the, the kickoff and all the housekeeping I have to go through. Um, but this is Liquid Margins episode 42. Thank you for joining us in the summer when you should be on vacation. Maybe you're joining us from your vacation. That would be uh, impressive. Um, but I've got two uh, colleagues um, and co-conspirators here, clearly in, in office type environments, not on vacation, um, to talk about their work. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, I am Jeremy Dean, Vice President of Education at Hypothesis. This is Liquid Margins uh, 42, uh, Annotating the Future, Reimagining STEM Education. We're here to talk about social annotation in the STEM disciplines. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. <clears throat> we have an upcoming episode uh, next month. We're kind of slowing things down in the summer, but we have an episode coming next month, Social Annotation as Instructional Scaffolding. So this is about teachers who annotate. Uh, not all teachers uh, annotate. A lot of teachers use hypothesis social annotation for the students to have a conversation. So this is going to be talking about the use cases for why instructors would pre-populate a text with annotations or uh, or respond to their to their students, uh, the role of the teacher in the annotation space. Um, so please join us for that if you're interested. It's uh, kind of foreshadowing some features that are coming from Hypothesis that will help teachers create annotations. Um, so we're excited about that episode. Uh, this is really about, this is a uh, Liquid March is really a show about uh, annotation strategies, um, talking deep, deeply and pedagogically with practicing instructors uh, in the, from uh, talking about their classroom experience. It's not a general introduction to hypothesis. Uh, if you're interested in a general introduction to hypothesis, I recommend you reaching out to education at hypothesis. This is more of a pedagogical conversation. Uh, there is a Q&A. Feel free to uh, chime in on the Q&A and then ask a question. And uh, myself and the panelists or uh, our customer success team that's, that's on hand will um, be able to answer some of those questions. And then if you uh, need closed captioning, uh, that's something that you can turn on yourself uh, using the cease, uh, closed caption icon in the Zoom menu, which is uh, should be at the bottom of your screen. All right, without further ado, let's talk about annotation in STEM. Um, and I have a big disclaimer at the start here, <clears throat> which is I'm a doctor, uh, but my doctorate is in English literature. Um, so I can basically prescribe summer reading and that's about it. Um, but we brought in some experts, teacher scholars from a range of STEM disciplines to talk about their work. Um, we have a mathematician, we have a biochemist, and we may at some point have a computer scientist join us who was scheduled to join us, but is uh, not here yet. Um, especially in English, there's a long tradition of close reading text that is part of the scholarly and pedagogical history of the discipline. Uh, and it's true that much of the early adoption of hypothesis of social annotation was in the humanities disciplines like like English. We've seen huge adoption, for example, in first year writing, uh, freshman composition. Uh, over time, though, it's been clear uh, that we've started to gain traction uh, in STEM disciplines. Uh, I was just looking over a list of our summer courses, and this is kind of fun, uh, and I'm seeing microbiology, introduction to genetics, pri primate biology, bacteriology, biopsychology, research lab in psychology, forensic psychology, general physics, information visualization, data science, video game design, elementary statistics with probability, microeconomics, pharmacology, evidence-based practice in nursing, global nutrition, pharmacology, geohazards and natural disasters, and intro to fingerprints, and then my favorite, hemp cultivation and post-harvest processing. Um, I think there's got to be some science 
in there. So there's a lot of STEM instructors who are using social annotation in, in their courses, and we're here to learn from some of our most active teacher scholars in this area about the role of reading in STEM, uh, about the pedagogy of social annotation in STEM, and also just generally and practically how they're using hypothesis social annotation in their courses. courses. So with us today are Ashley McHale, mathematics professor at Las Positas College in California, and Emily Reagan, chemistry and biochemistry professor at Metro State in Denver. And I just want to check here that Russell didn't show up yet. He did not show up yet. Okay, so it's just the three of us so far. We'll see if the computer scientist uh, Zoom bombs us later. Um, but I just want to start off with allowing you guys to introduce yourselves, where you teach, what you teach, and a little bit of your teaching philosophy. And maybe we can start with you, Emily. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm at Metropolitan State University um, here in Denver, and we were founded back in 1965 to serve the adult population of Denver. Anyone with a GED or a high school diploma could come get an education here. We have recently in 2019 received um, Hispanic serving institution designation, and we have a high number of transfer students. About 52% of our students have transferred from another institution. And I teach general chemistry and biochemistry two courses, and I really um, value students being able to construct knowledge, be able to have an active role in their learning, right? We have to engage with content to really learn it. I think um, quizzing is important. I think um, exploring simulations are important. I think lab work is important. And I think engaging with readings in a thoughtful way is important. Amazing. Uh, I love that. Students uh, constructing knowledge. Ashley, tell us a little bit about uh, yourself and, and Las Positas. Sure. So my name is Ashley McHale. I have been teaching at Las Positas for 15 years now in the mathematics department. Um, I have... Oh gosh, what can I say? Um, so Las Positas College is one of 116 community colleges in California. It is the largest system in the nation. We are also designated as a Hispanic serving institution. Um, recently, Las Positas has received several accolades from different organizations. Um, Intelligent and Niche have named us number one community college in California. Um, Niche na named us number one community college in the name or number six community college in the nation. So we're very proud of all of the things that we do and they take into consideration transfer and diversity and um, all just all of the things that make where I work absolutely amazing. Um, I teach specifically mostly statistics and algebra classes and also um, what we call concurrent support. So they are sidecar classes to transfer level classes that help students um, do that just in time remediation that they need to do. Um, I also teach in the Puente, Umoja and middle college learning communities. So Puente is specifically for students who are interested in um, the Hispanic culture. Um, they, any student can join, but we tend to focus on, um, you know, things that are relevant to the Hispanic community. Umoja is uh, all around the African American diaspora. And then middle college is students who are currently in high school, who are then coming to uh, community college and taking their high school classes and also community college classes and earning double credit. So um, we have a lot of really great programs on our campus. And I just, I love working there. That's awesome. Um, cool. I just had actually a really quick follow-up question for you, Ashley, just about um, the sort of introductory math courses in the California Community College system. <laughs> There's sure. a specific math program for, you know, the, the kind of transfer level math. Is that right? Um, so uh, California has uh, passed several laws that essentially restrict students who have a high school degree um, from taking pre-transfer level math class, math and English classes. So when students enter with a high school diploma into any California community college, it is mandated that we place them directly into transfer level math and English. So they shouldn't be allowed or they, they can't take pre-transfer level math or English. Um, they have to start right away, um, giving them credit for that high school um, content that they've learned. And those courses that you teach, are they some of the courses that are 
yes. those type of courses that yes. the students just coming into the California Community Colleges or Las Cositas would be taking? Exactly. So I, I primarily teach statistics, which makes up about two thirds of our entire mathematics um, department. Wow. Uh, we have quite a, quite a number of statistics uh, classes on our books for that. And if I can just put a finer point on it, is it, it's, it's true then that five, I don't know how many years ago, before those laws were passed, you would be teaching a kind of more remedial, for lack of a better word, uh, tracks, and then transfer level, they would be separate? When I first started at Las Cositas in 2007, over half of our, um, over half of our class offerings were pre-transfer level. And so okay. just in the past four years, actually, can, I, I believe it was starting last year, we have completely eliminated pre-transfer with the exception of that middle college cohort, because they are still in high school, we are still able right. to offer one, um, basically like an algebra two intermediate algebra level class. And that's okay. the only pre-transfer level class we teach. All right, maybe maybe in some of your responses you can touch on. You probably have a sense of why I'm digging in there, uh, but we'll we'll leave it at that for now. Um, and we'll just start talking about, um, you know, oh, I'm sorry, did I not have this slide up? There's the lovely people in front of you in still form and represented here is, uh, is Russell Vital, who may still be joining us. I'll just quickly check the panels to make sure he hasn't. Um, shown up. I wasn't. I was excited. We'll have to have him back to talk about hypothesis and computer science, but we've got a mathematician, we've got a biochemist, so I think we're going to have plenty of surface area here in the STEM disciplines to cover. Um, and the first question I have for you, and maybe we can start with you, Emily, is what drew, do you, what drew you to social annotation in your STEM courses? And I'll just say that part of my bias, one of my biases here is like, do, do they really have to do the reading in biochemistry and math? Is it really about reading? So, you know, one of my questions, you know, underlying this is, uh, you know, to curious about the importance or the role of the reading in your courses and in, in, in addition to um, you know, what first drew you to social annotation. So Emily, why don't you tackle this one first? Yeah, so back in the 2015-2016 school year, we started a biochemistry major in addition to a chemistry major, and we had to develop a second semester biochemistry course that was really a continuation of biochemistry one that continued with lipid metabolism, nitrogen metabolism topics that we didn't cover in that first semester course. So I got to design that course, and I designed some activities for students to work on in the class, and I would draw on um, papers, some readings for the students to do. And I initially was assigning those outside of class and the students were not doing them, completely not doing them. Showing up to class and then the time that I had thought we would be using for discussion and, and working in groups answering questions instead was spent letting the students silently read. And then students were complaining, why are we reading in class? <laughs> we could be reading outside of class. I'm like, you could be reading outside of class, but you weren't. And that's why we're reading in class. It was a really Really funny kind of like chicken and egg problem I had for a few semesters. And so finally, in the spring of 2020, I started using hypothesis. And that was really fortunate because this is a face-to-face -face class, but using hypothesis is a really robust way of having asynchronous student-student interactions. And that really set me up for success in that crazy semester where we had to pivot online halfway through. So that was just really lucky. But what I love about hypothesis is it's the one way I actually can get students to do the readings or at least engage with portions of the readings. I guess I don't have a guarantee that they read every word, but they're certainly opening the readings and engaging with them. And I can see the comments that they're making and they're responding to their classmates. And so for me, this is the closest thing to kind of a, a miracle cure or a magic bullet that I found in education for really prioritizing reading in everyone's to-do list because we have a Canvas integration. I can make it an assignment. I can give a small number of points for it. And so there's now a due date and some accountability and a little bit of a carrot. Um, and so I am really thrilled that I actually can get students to do the reading now. And that does let us spend our time in class in kind of more exciting ways. That's amazing. Folks, you heard it here first from a scientist. Hypothesis is a miracle cure. I quote, a miracle <laughs> cure. <laughs> Let's see if we can get such a soundbite from the mathematician. Um, Ashley, tell us about uh, what drew you to social annotation and maybe a little bit about, you know, why does reading matter in math? Sure. So um, what drew me first to social annotation was during that pandemic, I was searching 
everywhere for interesting ways to get that student to student interaction. To have an online class, you have to have student to content, student to instructor, and student to student interactions. Student to content's easy. They they watch the videos, they you know do the homework. Uh, student to instructor, feedback both ways. But the student to student primarily was being solved with discussion boards and they are boring and they are tedious. And I just, I, I would come up with these great questions and it just, it just felt so artificial. And so when I heard about Hypothesis, I jumped on webinars and I learned about it and I found out an English professor at my college was also using it or thinking about using it. And then um, that, that was the main reason. A secondary reason, about two years prior, our department had decided to go um, OER. So online ed resources, our textbooks were starting to creep up into the 200, 300, $400 level at that point. Um, we have a, a self-accelerated program that every time we got a new edition, we had to then revamp all of the content for the course. And it was becoming overwhelming amounts of work. So we decided if we can just solidify the textbook, then we don't have to continue this complete overhaul every two or three years in this, in this uh, mode of learning. So um, I was one of the first that decided, okay, let's do statistics. It's fairly straightforward. There are already great books out there. And I curated a textbook on LibreText from um, the OER OpenStax statistics textbook, along with some others. And in that curation, there were mistakes. So a secondary reason for using Hypothesis that first semester in 2020 was to get my students to proofread the online book. So they were able to go through and highlight passages that they didn't understand, that didn't make sense, or that were mistakes in the, in the curation that I could then go back and correct. Um, and then you had a second part. What was your second part? I already forgot. Oh, reading and math specifically. Um, mathematics, STEM in general, very precise, very formal um, language is used in these disciplines. And specifically in math, we make use of undefined terms and unproven statements because we want to avoid the circular reasoning and the circular definitions that can happen. Um, and so it's very important that our language is very precise. So that kind of reading is very different than reading a novel or reading a poem or reading in history. Um, it, it's just, it, it's, it can be difficult for the students that haven't engaged in it. And so students would buy this $200, $300 textbook and then only open it for homework. That, that's not helpful. So how do I get them to see the value of the textbook beyond just homework, right? And mostly um, in statistics specifically, uh, details like who is funding the study, how it was conducted, how data was collected, um, what tests were being run are super important to understand the validity and the bias of that study. And so helping the students be able to um, flesh that out on their own and see that in that social annotation to struggle with that content was, um, was really important and, and amazing to see happen in real time. And Jeremy, so cool. could, yeah, go ahead, Emily. Could I hop in here because I wanted to follow up on the OER thread, the Open Educational Resources. The other thing that Hypothesis allowed me to do was to adopt an OER into my Biochemistry two course. I had been wanting to for many years. The general chemistry class that I teach, which is asynchronous online, I developed to be OER way back in 2015, but the text I was looking at for my biochemistry two course, um, biochemistry free for all out of, a, um, so by some faculty at Oregon, let's see, Oregon, let's see, Oregon State University. The PDF is like 3,600 some pages long. It is insane. It is completely awkward and very difficult to navigate. And I just did not know how I was going to use that textbook for my course. And then with hypothesis, I just had to go in and make little mini PDFs that were the little chunks I wanted my students to read, anywhere from maybe just six pages to 30 pages, but whatever that chunk was. And then I just put those in 
um, throughout the semester. And so I have a reading that's after every single lecture that I do. And that way I can really direct the student's attention to the portion of the textbook that's relevant of interest that I really want them to look at. And so they really also for me, Hypothesis and OER went hand in hand, and it was a way that I could make an open educational resource more usable for my class. Oh, that's I, great. I love that. I think it's really, sorry. I think it's really interesting, Emily. You say you have them read it both. Um, you have them read it after your lectures or after your lessons. So I do the opposite. I have them read it before and kind of like prime the pump and get them ready for the vocabulary and definitions, even though they may not understand everything. And then they come into the lessons and they already have that vocabulary. In it. So I think that that's really interesting that we do it differently. Well, I do it. It depends on the reading. Some of the readings are in advance and some are after. And there's when they're when it's going over a weekend, sometimes I have two readings for them to do. So it kind of depends on how the timing works out and the different topics. But I sometimes have them pre-reading and sometimes they're reading the content after they have the lecture on it. And it's interesting because I will get students commenting, ooh, I never heard this before. I'm like, wait a minute, I definitely covered that in lecture. Okay. And it's a, it's a humbling reminder to me that just because I say something does not mean that they hear it. Uh, so it actually, it's fun to have it both ways. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. It's, I think you said something like that, Ashley, that you kind of want to, or no, you did or Emily, right, that you want to make sure they crack the book that they've, that they've been exposed to, because sometimes it takes a few times, the lecture, the follow-up reading, the reading before, the lecture that, that solidifies it or the discussion that does. Um, so it's really just about, you know, re reiterating some of the concepts. Um, <clears throat> I had one quick follow-up for you, Ashley, about proofreading the OER. So the OER had mistakes you and your students were reading it, you were able to, you you use them or you work together to note mistakes, and then you were able to change the underlying text um, because it's a, a openly licensed. You could go in and change that stuff, even though it came from OpenStax or LibreText or whatever. Yes, so LibreText has the ability for you to edit content in the, um, so, so you can pull from multiple textbooks into one whole textbook, and pu publish it on their on their website. And I, I believe it's out of UC Davis. So I think um, Davis is what houses it. And then um, you can go in and either request that the original author change it or make a copy and change it yourself because it is that open license. And when you copy it and make it uh, yourself, your, your own, does it end up as a PDF that you use with Hypothesis? Um, I PDF it from the website and then use it inside Canvas. That's okay, generally very how cool. I Mm -hmm. That's really neat. I've, I've talked about that in OER, the idea of that circularity of like, okay, you, you make your OER, it comes from different sources, you teach with it, whether students are giving you the feedback or you realize, wow, that section, people did not get that example, let's swap out that example. I mean, that's the dream of the OER is to have that kind of iterative process. And I've always dreamed that hypothesis could be a, a way to um, to help revise or, or note places for revision. Um, so I'm very happy to hear that, that you're actually doing that because it, it was just an idea in my head several years ago. Um, awesome. Well, uh, this is great. Uh, let's talk a little bit about, um, about how you're using Hypothesis in your courses. And this is why I'd like to know, you know, like, how do you set it up? What are they reading with Hypothesis? And how do you set it up? Is it a two annotations, one reply thing? Is it something more rigorous? Is it different at different times in the semester? And this time, let's uh, let's start with you, Ashley. Sure. The very first uh, encounter with Hypothesis my students have is to annotate my syllabus. Um, in, in During the pandemic, again, you know, just essentially, and I had been an online teacher for years before I taught every now and then an online class. Um, but it wasn't really until the pandemic where you realized, even though I was able to teach it, I probably wasn't as good as I should have been. I wasn't delivering the best way that I could have been doing. So I was scrambling that summer to just learn as much as I could. Um, I think, uh, it, it just, I don't know, it, it lit a fire in me to, to get better at what I do. And one of the things that I had learned about was something called a liquid syllabus, where you essentially create your syllabus, you put it on a website. And so students can see your syllabus before they ever enter your class. 
It allows them to kind of, they already do the, the professor shopping, right? They're looking on Rate My Professor as terrible as that is and as biased as that is, that's what they use. So instead of giving them that only one point of which professor should I take, oh, hey, find out how I teach my class before you ever sign up for me. So I created an online syllabus. It was just through Google Sites. I have it posted in my faculty profile on my um, on my uh, college's website so that students can go to my faculty profile and click on that syllabus. Now, then in, in the class, they are able to um, annotate the syllabus. I ask for two annotations for the syllabus. They can, add, and I just use the hypothesis, you know, syllabus suggested um, examples, like what, what should you do, right? There's a great um, assignment that Hypothesis puts out for a syllabus. And they go through and they ask their questions. They, they, you know, comment on, wow, this is really helpful that you, you know, you understand we have lives outside of our class or that you're willing to help us or whatever it is that I have in that syllabus that they're able to, you know, um, attach and, and appreciate and, and question. Um, and with that, it also removes the need on that first day to read through the syllabus and ask for questions that students tend to just, you know, their eyes glaze over, they don't really pay attention, it allows you to give them other activities, um, more community building activities. So it's kind of the syllabus I say would, was really nice because you can do two community building activities. If you're doing an in-person class, you do one in person and then you get them to do the community building on the syllabus and they're making connections with hypothesis in the syllabus online. Um, after that, um, I usually separate my uh, textbook by chapters. So I have the chapter that they're, they're going to be learning at the very beginning of the module in my online class, or even in my in-person class, I still use Canvas to interact with my students in person. And they read through the section that they're going to do, and I have them post five annotations. Most of them, and, and it can be anything. It can be a reply, or it can be just a, a straight out you know, uh, annotation directly to the, to the text. Um, and then they uh, annotate the chapters throughout the semester and they, they tend to go back because we're doing like one or two sections per class. So even though I have the whole chapter instead of a section, I, I, I kind of like Emily's idea of breaking it up. I may think about breaking it up into sections instead of chapters um, to see if that might get a little more engagement. But um, yeah, I think that's that's what I do. Amazing. Emily, tell us a little bit about how uh, you use Hypothesis. Yeah, so I use Hypothesis really robustly in my Biochemistry 2 class, which is an upper division second semester biochemistry class. I also have the students annotate the syllabus at the beginning. And like I mentioned, I have these small chunked readings that there's at least one after every class. And sometimes I have two readings. Most often they're excerpts from that um, biochemistry free-for-all textbook, but I also use journal articles, um, especially kind of um, retrospectives that maybe scientists write about their biggest discoveries that kind of include some research data and some experimentation, but it's really um, from many different papers and they're kind of summarizing the greatest hits. These could be Nobel Prize winners. And those are kind of fun types of articles for students to get to read, to learn about some really major discoveries, but also get a chance to analyze some data. So the majority of my readings are from the textbook, but I also have selected journal articles. Um, we've been doing a unit on COVID-19. And so even just pulling in something from the World Health Organization about RNA vaccines, or, you know, I can pull in also even like a New York Times article that's talking about um, the journey to making the vaccines. I don't know, a variety of different um, sources can come in and support the material that I'm covering. So the, the students in that class have quite a lot of assignments. I have also a, a large general chemistry course. It's asynchronous online. I usually have about 80 students. And I've been experimenting with just a single hypothesis assignment in groups in that class. And I've used those assignments to get my students to identify elements like claim, evidence, and reasoning in a text, um, and have kind of different prompts for different people, depending on are they the first couple people to respond, or the third, fourth, fifth, 
person to respond. So that's been fun to play around with. And then the other area is general chemistry one is a general studies course. And so there's kind of some broad learning objectives that could apply to any introduction to science class or introductory science class. And those I always find very challenging. Um, like what I mean by this is one of these learning objectives is think critically, evaluate the credibility of scientific information and interpret the impact of its use or misuse on society. I mean, that is huge, you guys, huge. And I'm teaching a class that already has so much content I'm trying to cover. But I found an interesting reading about using um, technology to detect fake science. And the students read that and we had it, in hypothesis, they were able to have conversations about, you know, what is fake science? What are different claims they've heard people make? How do you analyze things? And I realized one reason this is such a hard thing for me to teach is it has elements of psychology and elements of statistics. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of knowledge that goes into being able to identify um, on the misuse of science. So um, that, again, that's a very broad learning objective that's been given to me <laughs> for my course that I've, I've really struggled with how to teach that. And I've explored using hypothesis to address that with my students. You reminded me that I also use newspaper articles and um, online um, online articles, as well as I love incorporating history into mathematics because it just adds that much more. And you're exactly right, Emily. It makes it relevant to the students and it makes it more interesting than just that dry old textbook. Um, one of my favorite stories from statistics is the story of um, the student T distribution and how William Gossett working at uh, Guinness published under that name, you know, the Guinness Brewing Company. And it's like, did you know the tea distribution was used in brewing beer? And they're like, wait, what? So students get all into that kind of stuff. And it's it's just so much fun. Um, 2020 was the election. And so we had lots of annotations on uh, articles <laughs> about polling. And I try to stay away from partisan politics type stuff. It's it's kind of, it, it's, a, it's a touchy subject in general. And so, you know, so we look at process. How, how did they poll? What, you know, what is this saying about the polling, not about the, the, you know, politics itself? And so, yeah, it was really rich conversations inside of Hypothesis. So one of the one of the questions that we get a lot from folks who are newer to hypothesis is, you know, what how do I get them to to annotate? How do I direct them? And you guys suggested a few uh, ways, and I um, I'll, I'll reiterate them. But I'd also be just curious if there, you have anything more to say about how you prompt students to have those good discussions that you just mentioned, Ashley. I do want to give a shout out. Ashley mentioned the um, syllabus annotation starter assignment. We do have starter assignments, so we do have kind of stock language that you can put at the top of an assignment, not just for the syllabus, but for a variety of different types of activities that our CS team has created. So that's a great resource. Uh, Emily, I was super fascinated about your point about different prompts at different points in a reading. Um, that was super interesting to me. So I just would like to hear a little bit more from you guys about how you prompt students. There's a reading, whether it's the textbook or an article, and you know what's the direction um, and does that change over time? And uh, maybe Ashley, we'll start with you. Sure. Um, within the content, a lot of times I'll sprinkle in questions. Um, and so I will create the assignment and then I'll immediately go in and add questions in where I think there might be confusion, where there might need clarification, or I want them to think a little bit harder about. And so, you know, helping them start that conversation, absolutely. And then most of the time, it's the, um, you know, allowing them the freedom to express themselves in, you know, post a meme that's relevant. Mm. So, um, you know, some of students have gone out and found memes relevant to statistics or relevant to, you know, whatever it is we're talking about, probability, what have you, and they'll post them in there and get a good laugh or videos that, you know, a lot of them will reach out for supplemental videos. And if they find one, oh, this explains what a stochastic mm. process is, and they'll pop that in. And so other students can see too. Um, and so really the, the guiding questions within and then also just allowing them that freedom to, to make their own um, kind of, I kind of like to tell them you're creating this textbook in hype, you know, you're creating these annotations in hypothesis as a class wide cheat sheet for the, for the tests. Um, because in my online classes, I do allow open notes, open book. 
And so oh. they have the ability to go back and see all of these annotations that they can create um, as a class and not just individually. I love that too. It's a very open education, right? You're creating, I don't know if I'd use the term cheat sheet, but you're creating, their textbook is a kind of base material and you're creating something that's a resource for you and your classmates moving on. You're going to add to it. You're going to add the memes that make it more interesting. You're going to add the videos that supplement. One question though, Ashley, though, is that do you have some place in your you know, curricular material where you're saying, you know, here's some ways you could reply, you could create annotations, like you can add memes, you can add videos. So you're teaching them a little bit about the possibilities of what can be done in an annotation. Absolutely. At the very beginning, um, with the syllabus annotation assignment, as well as within each assignment, there there are some guiding uh, guiding questions or guiding instructions. Here are some things you can do when you see a word you don't understand. Go find the definition. When you see, you know, um, uh, uh, an example that you, you know, maybe it doesn't have the complete answer, try to answer it and po post it for other mm -hmm. students to, to take cool. a look. So that kind of stuff. Great. If that's something you're willing to share, we, we'd love to add it to our open education resource collection of, uh, of social annotation materials. Um, Emily, tell us a little bit more about how you prompt uh, students in, in the annotation um, practice. Most of the time, it's really just very simple. The requirement is to make either three annotations or responses to classmates' annotations. And um, so I just explain that it could be pretty open, like things that you found interesting, things you would like to know more about. Um, responding to classmates is super helpful. I really love it when there's sometimes there's some students who just love to ask questions. And it's really nice when there's other students that love to answer those questions. Um, what I do then is I review the annotations a couple hours before I go to lecture for this biochemistry two class, which mm. is a face-to-face -face class. And I use that to guide the beginning of my lecture. So if there's an area that students have flagged questions on, I can talk about that some at the beginning of my lecture. I can say, oh, okay, we wanna go a little deeper on this topic. Let's explore some more here. Or I realize there's some confusion on this. Let's clarify or... Um, even just, wow, your classmate shared this really cool resource. I wanted to bring it to everyone's attention if you haven't gone back and seen it. So um, in general, I keep it very simple. Uh, there are some specific assignments where I give more specific guidance, but in general, it's pretty free form. They get to engage with the reading the way they want. That's cool. And Emily, do you annotate at all beside them or ahead of them or in response to most of them? I don't typically annotate ahead of them. Sometimes it's just things like, um, start here <laughs> if this is a part of the textbook or, um, you know, don't forget to do this, you know, be sure to go down to the bottom too. There's good stuff down there. Like, so sometimes there's some guidance like that. Um, and then I wait to make comments until again, shortly before the lecture. And then if there's questions that haven't been answered, I do try to answer them at that time. Okay. Um, so I just have one more question uh, formally for the for you guys, and I just want to remind our audience that if you guys have questions for the panelists, I uh, would love to uh, have you put those in the Q&A and we can surface them in our uh, live Q&A. Um, I did just want to note I turned off my sharing uh, so that people could see the fullness of our faces. Uh, I think that helps with the, with the uh, Zoom experience. Um, but the sort of final formal question is, I'm just curious what kind of results you've seen from social annotation. And I realize that uh, maybe you haven't conducted an IRB uh, approved study yet. Um, so those results, this may be anecdotal data. I'm also curious, you know, if you've had feedback from students about the use of the tool. Um, so yeah, just what kind of results are you seeing from social annotation in your STEM courses? And maybe we'll start with you, uh, Ashley. Sure. Um, improved definition, improved understanding of definitions, improved understanding of concepts, um, seeing it or listening to it or hearing it one time isn't enough. And, and, you know, trying to get the students to understand that the time outside of class is meant to study as well as homework, you know, being able to review. So we talk about the, you know, the curve of understanding, the curve of remembering, um, and, and, just reminding them that you you can't just see it one time and then remember it. You've got to see it over and over and over again. And so allowing them that multiple ways of getting that content um, is, is incredibly important. 
um, across the board, more engagement, more student to student interaction, um, not only in my online class, because that is obvious when you're looking at the hypothesis annotation there, but also when I use it in my in-person class, the students are making connections online and then they come into class and they uh, formalize those connections in person. So a lot of that is happening, which is really, um, it's just beautiful to see them working together. It really is. And then um, I have one quote, the student's response to social annotation, most of them just fa are fascinated by the way this works because um, when I first saw it, it looked almost like Facebook or, um, you know, uh, I don't know, the, it, you could set it up with if lots of videos, it could be like TikTok or Instagram or what have you. And so them already living so heavily online and allowing them another way to engage in education online, um, another reason that really drew, me, drew it to me. But um, one quote that I got from a student really early, my first semester of using it, asynchronous learning is difficult, but annotating the textbook as a class and conversing via discussion posts are good ways to virtually do collaborative exercises and learning. So my students are really valuing the, um, the work that they're doing in Hypothesis. That's cool. So I think I have a quote here from a mathematician saying that hypothesis is the next TikTok. That's what she said, pretty much. <laughs> we can we can edit it. <laughs> uh, I actually, I actually, I do want to just draw something out. You mentioned this before, and you just reminded me. You've been talking about you talked about student to this, uh, content interactions, student to student interactions, and student to teacher interactions. You're talking there without mentioning the. Um, the RSI standards, but that's what you're alluding to, the kind of regular substantive interaction kind of online standard. Is that kind of in the back of your mind there? Yes. Um, anytime we're teaching an online class, we have those regulations in the back of our heads. Um, you know, you, you want to think that your job is this beautiful thing that you can, you know, you have lots of freedom to do, but you, you have regulations in the background. You have to do these certain things and you have to check those boxes so that, you know, accreditation standards are met, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but those those three things, I mean, probably abstractly, I, they they seem valuable. Like student to content, you want them to read. Student to student, you want them to interact, peer peer uh, build knowledge together. And student to teacher, you'd like there to be a teacher present. And for you, um, with those RSI standards in the back of your head, you found hypothesis to be useful for um, kind of fulfilling them. Absolutely. Um, and and yes, I mean they they are absolutely valuable. Uh, it it's the only it, it makes sense for learning. You have to have these three you know it, it pillars for learning. Um, and I I want to push on the instruct student to instructor because it it does have to go both ways. Um, so student in instructors to students that's really easy because that's in that feedback that's in the grading that's in you know us telling them how they're doing, but I would like to encourage anyone considering any kind of teaching to make sure you're getting that feedback from your students, constantly asking them, how am I doing? How are, right. how do you think you're doing in this class, right? So I have yeah. a, a whole uh, level of metacognition and that throughout my class where students are talking about what are they, what are they learning? What are they struggling with? How are they going to um, correct that struggling? How, how are they going to understand that or what resources are they going to use? And then also, um, you know, what kind, what, how can I all throughout my classes, how can I improve? What am I doing that you need me to see change? I love that so much, but I, I feel like, and the, there's a strand, strand with both of you here, right? If you start off by annotating a syllabus and your syllabus is liquid, as you described, and you're starting off by saying, I want to hear your voice, you know, and you have now a, a, a vehicle for that voice, which is this tool. You can ask a question. When he was talking about flagging a question, you're building a culture where that bi-directional feedback from students coming to you is, there's a, there's a platform for it, right? Um, I think not just in social annotation, but more generally, and it's a very powerful kind of reconfiguring of the classroom. I commend you on it. Um, what was the question? I just got wrapped up. Oh, uh, what kind of results have you seen, uh, Emily, in your courses? And again, uh, any kind of student feedback, uh, qualitative, you know, thoughts from you, uh, anecdotal would be most welcome. Well, I just want to say, Ashley, I love that you've just clarified for me that this thing I'm getting, one of the things I'm getting from hypothesis is 
that student to instructor interaction instead of just instructor to student. Um, one thing I wanted to say about that is um, there's always the quiet students or the students that if you're doing, if you have a face-to-face -face class are not as likely to speak up in the classroom. They're not as prone to ask those questions. What I love about hypothesis is everyone gets to have their ideas heard, their voice heard through those annotations. And so I think for people that aren't as quick to speak up verbally, it can be hard to to know what those students are thinking or where they're at. And Hypothesis has really given me a glimpse into their thoughts. Students make so many cool connections between research projects that they're engaged in, things they've learned in other classes. Like we're really, they're building a web of connections and sharing that with each other. And I think it's super cool. I also love the positive affect, like students can say, whoa, that's so cool. I never knew that. And just bringing some of this wonder and awe that gets people um, really juiced up and also helps us remember things better. So I think <laughs> that's one thing I like. As far as kind of more of a data approach, about 85% of my students from spring 2020 through this past spring 2020, 23 semesters since I've been using Hypothesis, about 85% of my students are getting 90 plus percent of the points from the annotations. I would say 95 to 100% of the points. So the vast majority of my students are engaging to the full extent that I'm asking them to. I do find that there's a handful of students that are maybe just doing about half of what I'm asking them to do, but I've never had a student do zero. <laughs> so they're at least doing half of what I'm wanting, but the majority of them are fully engaging in the way that I hoped. So that, you know, to me is encouraging. And um, students really do seem to enjoy being able to share those thoughts with each other, to share the, the videos, the answers to questions. And I think it really helps students when readings are hard, especially to feel less alone. The fact that someone else had to look up a definition to a word and thought to share it. Students sometimes say, thank you for doing that. I was going to have to look that up too. And it normalizes the fact that what we're doing is hard. It's hard, but doable. And I think that's really a beautiful thing. Uh, I, I had all sounds of I had all those sounds of assent through what you were just saying, but I was on mute. Um, I love that. Yeah, normalizes that it's hard. I think that that's really important. Um, you know, I remember times in college and in grad school feeling like I don't understand this reading. Maybe I don't belong here. And if you see that other people are asking questions, that, that you know, there's a process here. You look something up when you don't understand it, um, and that you can ask questions and that you can learn from other people. Then you realize, okay, that's just part of. The work that we do, it is supposed to be hard, um, and part of what the, and this tool, you know, helps us do that kind of work. Um, uh, quick question, uh, Emily, you were saying, is hypothesis graded activity for you that contributes to a final grade? Yeah, and it's a, a kind of a minor <laughs> percent. It's like kind of a participation grade. So each little reading assignment is worth three points, and they get one point per annotation. You know, again, it can be original annotation or response to a classmate. So it's very easy for me to grade. Did you put three <laughs> things into this reading? You get your three points. And um, you just did two, I'll give you two points. And you did five, I'll give you a happy comment <laughs> in there to say, that was awesome. Thank you. But um, so, it, it's a very simple system, but I think it just helps there be some accountability. Do you use the uh, do, you, do you use Speed Grader in Canvas at mm -hmm. Metro I do, State? Exactly. And yep. so, do you do do you use the feedback tool where you give private feedback, or is it mostly mm -hmm. just the the grades? Okay. Yeah, especially when those students go above and beyond, I like to make a little comment, or um, if there was, you know, usually if there's something I want to. Um, respond to, I'll just, you know, respond in the thread if, you know, I don't know if there's something that just seems to be more appropriate to be one on one to the student, I would also use that, that feedback there. And I, Ashley, are you grading? I do the same. So um, a substantive comment, so I can't just be, oh, yay, that's great. Or I didn't think about that before. It needs to be a little bit more than that. Um, but mine are 10 point assignments, five annotations, two points per annotation. Similar, you know, it, it is like a participation grade. Um, and I try to give my feedback within hypothesis so that it is uh, mm -hmm. visible. Um, if it's an, if it's not a substantive comment, I do do that privately for the student, um, just to, you know, not call them out and say, Hey, you need to do a little bit better job. Um, you know, that, that should be within just for the student, but 
um, if there are questions that they bring up or whatnot directly in Hypothesis, yeah. So the only question that I've seen come up that I think I'm sort of interested in, uh, uh, I guess we do have a question about grading. Um, and I think we just addressed it uh, organically. Um, so that's good. Oh, you addressed it, addressed it too. Ashley, you're all over the place. Um, but one question, I don't know if you guys have something to say about this. I, I did try to get somebody from a, a K-12 school to, to join us today, to give us that perspective. Um, and I know you guys are both teaching at the college level. Um, although you're seeing some students, I guess, who may still be in high school in some of those programs you were describing, Ashley, but um, both of you, I think, or especially Ashley, you're talking about students that are very new to the discipline that you're talking about and to the kind of level of uh, discipline that you're talking about. But either of you guys have thoughts about hypothesis in STEM, you know, before uh, before the college level? Or is it any different? Or could you see a use case there, some value? Ashley, I see the beginning of a thought coming from your mouth. Go for it. <laughs> yeah, so, so in that middle college program, I'm teaching primarily juniors in high school. Okay. So um, my entire intermediate algebra class in the fall semester, I'm gearing up for it this coming fall, entire class is juniors in high school. And um, even though they're on college and they're earning college credit, they are still considered juniors at their home, at their home high schools. And so um, I, I personally don't see it being difficult to incorporate at the high school level, um, I really can. I mean, the these students are so savvy with technology. Um, I absolutely could see uh, the the value in using a high school textbook or or um, journals for um, any kind of discipline or readings that they're doing online and having those students create that um, class wide social annotation in that content. Um, my, my juniors that I see almost every semester for the past four years, I think I've taught three, yeah, I've taught three classes in this cohort and, and they, they excel at it. They engage in it um, very easily and very well in, in the annotation. Yeah. Emily, any thoughts about K through 12 space? I mean, it strikes me that you're, um, you're coming about belonging the earlier we can get students thinking that they belong, that they that they that this reading is something they can do, that that science or math or whatever it is is something that they are capable of and could professionalize in is great. <laughs> any many additional thoughts about K through twelve and STEM and social annotation? Yeah, honestly, anytime you want students to read something and extract meaning from that written text, this could work well because it's directing them to the text and asking them to annotate what what they're getting from the text. So, and we expect that all over the place. I could see using this for pre-labs, you know, asking the student to read the lab in advance and make some annotations before coming into the classroom. Um, you know, it, they can be short readings. I think keep, keeping things very short and to the point so that we're being strategic with our students' time is helpful. You know, just a few pages, but it's very relevant to your course. That's what you want your students directing their attention to. That's great. And I, I will just add that we do see um, K through 12 usage of hypothesis. Obviously, it's not a major focus for us yet, uh, but I taught high school for many years and believe that this tool uh, definitely scales uh, down to middle school and to high school and maybe even into middle school because, you know, I think as you said, Emily, any, any breeding, uh, can be difficult at different times in your education process and having help, having a, a tool to dig into it and, and make that a social experience is, is powerful. Um, there is a, one question from an anonymous attendee. I think that we did um, cover this, um, but I just wanted to see if there's any other thoughts just around the difficulty of coming up with original substantive comments. This was, a, I think, kind of a, a little bit of an echo of something that you said, Ashley, like you're asking for substantive comments, so I can't just be like, yeah, I agree. You want something more. It sounds like both of you have nurtured a class, a, a classroom culture where students are saying quite a bit. But do you have any pro tips for, you know, people that are just getting a lot of I agrees or having a hard time, have students having a hard time coming up with some, some comments? Start with you, Ashley. I haven't had a good opportunity for that yet. I mean, my classes are 35 to 40, so it's not a whole lot. I mean, I don't consider that terribly large. 
Um, so they seem to be doing a pretty good job with it. Um, I would probably suggest that if they're they're just drawing a blank, like I have no idea what to write. Okay, well, read through it, read through comments, and then um, maybe look at an example and take the example, so, so because it's math, take the example and try to work it out on your own and then use your own words to explain how you did it. Not what they're doing, but maybe, you know, did you do it differently? Can you see doing it differently? Would you approach it in a different way? Um, just trying to get like pushing them a little bit of, you know, you, you have the ability to be creative, even in mathematics, there are, you know, options and opportunities for that. So, um, but, but sometimes some students, I, I have not encountered it personally, but I can see that some students might need a little push. They might need a little bit of handholding to get started. Um, but once you give them the idea, most of them are, are okay with it and they'll, they'll take it and go. I agree. Setting norms early in the semester is important. And that's when you can put most of your time into doing that gentle encouragement. Like, you know, really, I'm looking for something more substantial. I will say, though, because the students are centered on a reading, it's much easier to have substantive comments than if you're just doing a discussion post. So I really feel like mm. that just the nature of hypothesis leads to more substantive responses and interactions because we're grounded in that text. I need to let that one sit because there was such a profound encapsulation of the power of annotation in comparison to something like a discussion board. You have context. You're not, it's not a blank page. There's something to draw on. Um, that's beautiful. Um, I'll just add that I think both of Ashley and Emily have sort of described this, that they have a little, uh, I don't know what you call it, like a, um, a set of ways to interact with the text through annotation, right? It could be a meme, it could be this, right? So questions, things like that. So we see a lot of teachers developing that bank of like, I want three annotations on this. Your annotations could be any of these things. And there, there could be dozens of things, right? It could be a question, could be a definition, could be a meme, could be, you know, a, a, a paraphrase, maybe not a paraphrase, but, you know, lots of options depending on the class. Um, one question, one piece of the question from the anonymous attendee is about the, the size of the class. And I'll just add that Hypothesis has a grouping mechanism in all LMS integrations. So in Canvas, you know, it can map to Canvas groups. And so even in a large class, you can segment that down into a smaller um, uh, group of students so that, um, you know, it is true if you have 100 students on a five page text that a lot of real estate and ideas get taken up quickly, but you can always break down a, a, a class into smaller groups um, so that there's more space for students to interact with the text and, and get their voice heard. Um, wow, I am just uh, reeling with inspiration from this conversation. Uh, your students, uh, Ashley and Emily at, uh, at Las Positas and Metro State are incredibly lucky. Um, we are incredibly lucky to have uh, dedicated, inspiring instructors like you working, uh, especially in public education, uh, in our country. So, um, you know, I'm just thrilled th to have had this conversation. I do have a couple housekeeping things to finish with here. Um, if your school is not yet using Hypothesis, we are offering a fall back to school special. Um, so you can reach out to education at Hypothesis um, and get uh, Hypothesis installed at your learning management system to do the kinds of things that Emily and Ashley are talking about here. We have a discounted deal if you're just starting off uh, and includes unlimited access to the tool. And uh, part of what it includes, and this is also a thank you to the, co the customer success um, management team at Hypothesis who have been fielding some of the Q and A's and dropping things, dropping resources into the chat. Uh, we have a, a, a phenomenal customer success management uh, manager team here, customer success team here. Um, they build out resources, activities, assignments like the one that Ashley described. They lead uh, workshops for all our partners. They design custom workshops for specific campuses and specific disciplines. It really is one of the things that makes Hypothesis different. Probably has something to do with the fact that a lot of us are educators <laughs> and uh, don't really want to leave the classroom and so are still writing assignments and creating workshops and, and training modules for for um, for our colleagues that are still in the classroom. So it's it's really something special about Hypothesis, the, the success team and the success resources. Unfortunately, our summer workshop series is over. You missed it. Uh, they're all recorded and on YouTube. And you can stay tuned for our uh, 
our work, our back to school workshop series, which will kick off, um, you know, in August. Um, and again, it goes through things like annotation starter assignments. Um, it goes through things like creative ways to use hypothesis, how to use multimedia. There's a whole one on grading that we just had yesterday that went really well. Shout out to Suzanne Miller. Um, so stay tuned for fall workshops. We also have Hypothesis Academy, which is an asynchronous um, two-week course. Um, there's a 101 version, which is really an introduction to Hypothesis. It's a really cool way to um, actually get to know Hypothesis, but also to dig deeper. Emily, Ashley, have either of you done Hypothesis Academy yet? We have lots of veterans who take it. Um, it's a great uh, opportunity to deepen the practice. Uh, we do have another cohort for 101 starting on August 1st. And then we also have now um, a social annotation in the age of AI. How did we get through an hour of conversation without talking about chat GPT? Uh, it's amazing. It's the first time in the hour since last December that I was able to go an hour without talking about chat GPT. Um, we were old school today. That's great. Um, but we are engaging in conversation around chat GPT and the pedagogy of chat GPT and how to discourage the use of chat GPT through certain kinds of assignments, but also how to engage with chat GPT. And I think hypothesis can be useful in both those uh, trajectories. Um, with that, I just want to say thank you to the audience for joining us today. Um, thanks to the CS team and to the marketing team for their support uh, on the call. And then most of all, thank you, Emily and Ashley. I mean, I'm not just saying it, I'm really impressed and inspired by the conversation um, and just excited that I have my job to be able to talk to people like you and that we can spread the word about this cool tool and how it can be used and um, super interesting conversation. Really appreciate you both. Thanks, Jeremy. This is fun. Same. Thanks Thank you. Bye, everybody. Have a great afternoon.